to have Hector Rosario. Uh, Hector, uh, it's a pleasure to have you join us as the Director of Outreach and Festivals, which mm -hmm. sounds quite exciting. Some people are going to be interested and wondering why they similarly don't have titles to say that the Director of Festivals as well. So maybe you can give some people insights into how can, they could aspire to that. Hector, I'll, I'll give you a, a more formal introduction in just a moment, but okay. thrilled that you can join us as well. Um, I would suggest, um, again, to preserve the idea of the informality of this, folks, please introduce yourself in the chat by just indicating your names and your institutions and your email if you'd like. Uh, again, in lieu of us being together, um, we want to use this as a format that people can now work with each other around common interests. It may very well be we'd anticipate that you're all interested in the work of Julia Robinson and math in education. So that might be a common feature of ongoing uh, networking with other folks that are participating. Um, just a little bit of heads up about some other M education products and activities. Um, if you're not already a subscriber to the M Education Alliance uh, listserv, you could go to the, the website and subscribe. And that's a great opportunity to get reminders of eCafe events uh, such as this. Um, we also released a few weeks ago our first eZine journal, the EdTech Connected. Uh, you could find that on the M Education Alliance website. Um, if you have further questions or information or uh, information you'd like to share with us for addition into future e-news issues, please let us know by also sending us uh, an email that you could find on the website. For just one brief moment, Nicole, uh, you know, I want to give a shout out to Nicole Carney, uh, uh, who's our director of communication. Um, Nicole, if you want to say hello, if you can, and let, there you go. Yep. <laughs> hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. <laughs> Perfect, Nicole. And throughout, you'll be you'll be seeing Nicole will be dropping stuff into the chat, and then Scott Isprand, who's joining us as our director of strategic initiatives as well. And you can see his lovely picture uh, also. If um, I'm going to take a step back and show you this T-shirt that I'm wearing that we've officially adopted as our eCafe uh, T-shirt uh, logo, it so happens that this is a, an organization that's based in Agua Prieta, Mexico. Um, the overall initiative is supporting sort of cross-border uh, cultural relations, but they have a cafe called Cafe Justo that we will be randomly uh, distributing through lottery. Uh, one of these Cafe Justo T-shirts to people who attend our e-cafes. So um, again, one of, one of you lucky participants will be uh, receiving this t-shirt. Uh, and please let me know if you'd like more information about the overall work of this organization, uh, uh, Cafe Justo. I think without further ado, that's just to give some updates about some M Education Alliance products. We really want the bulk of time to be spent with uh, Hector and Hector, if you don't mind, just by way of background, um, you know, it, you grew up in Puerto Rico. Uh, you spent a lot of time uh, in places such as New York City and Chicago. But um, your love of math and logic puzzles with children, your, your scholarship in this, uh, this work as well, and work with a variety of institutions in both Puerto Rico, ar around the United States, including being a courtesy professor with the Department of Mathematics at the University of Florida. You have a PhD in mathematics education from Columbia University in 2003. So we're thrilled to have you, Hector. It was a great opportunity to, in fact, meet you, Hector. And I see Mark Saul is joining us as well. Um, I met Hector and Mark Saul at the National Math Festival in DC, I guess that was two years ago, uh, with my boy, who was uh, 17 at the time. And we were entranced by the work of Julia Robinson Math Festival. And I've been thrilled since then to deepen our relationship <clears throat> including featuring Julia Robinson Math Festival and a number of our prior symposia events, including most recently our Play Every Day virtual event that we have. So Hector, we saw this as a great opportunity to be able to share the good works of Julia Robinson Math Festival with those, those that are joining us today and really turning it over to you to tell us about your work, that of Julia Robinson Math Festival, and then engaging with dialogue with the other attendees. Thanks for joining us, Hector. Well, thank you, Tony, for that kind introduction uh, and uh, for uh, your words of appreciation for the work that we do at the Julia Robinson Mathematics Festival. Uh, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure to be here. And it's nice to see familiar faces also, Mark, Neil, uh, Sydney, even if the, 
if the cameras are off, I can think of your faces. So that's, uh, thank you for being here. And uh, hello. So now, um, as Tony said, we want to keep this informal and uh, that, that works well for us. I want to start with the mission statement of the Julia Robinson Mathematics Festival. And now this is one of the several linings of uh, COVID-19 that it has given us time to think about our priorities. And one of the things that I suggested that we look at was, um, let's, let's look at our mission statement and uh, so that we can better focus our work. So our mission statement as it reads uh, today is to inspire joy in mathematics through exploration and collaboration. And we do this by engaging educators and students through festive events, uh, supporting underserved and underrepresented communities and by creating high quality accessible materials. So it would be good to speak a little bit about the history of the festival. And the festival started in 2007. Uh, our founder, Nancy Blackman, wanted to honor uh, the time and the experience, uh, uh, the time that she spent with her father teaching her the mathematics and doing uh, fun problems. And so in 2007, um, she had you know, this idea and they hosted, we hosted the first festival at Googleplex and Google's headquarters. And uh, then the year after 2008, uh, there was one at Pixar and uh, somewhere else. And as people saw what we were about, they began to inquire and uh, approach us and they wanted to replicate that, those events. I said, well, I, I, they, they said, they, they thought they could do something similar at their host institutions, usually universities, colleges, then schools, and even churches. They all began little by little uh, approaching us, people all over the world, and so on. And by the end of 2019, we had uh, 421 festivals in uh, 345 domestic and 76 international festivals. So, you know, take a look at the, at the exponential growth of those festivals. So we were doing pretty well. We were excited about it. Uh, and then uh, we all know oh, COVID hit. And we were doing quite well in, in, uh, in 2020, uh, the first uh, three months we had already um, scheduled, maybe it was almost 40 festivals where we were on track to break our record again, uh, but then COVID happened and, uh, and we had to adjust. But before we, we go in there, so take a look, you know, so we were you know, uh, 26 states, uh, 17 different countries, six continents. So this was our reach from 2007 to 2020, actually, because the last in-person festival occurred in Australia, right at the beginning of March of 2020. And, uh, and there's a list of, of the countries there and so on. So now I'm gonna close this and I'm gonna close this also. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. So what makes a math festival attractive? Uh, I think that there are three things that make uh, three things that make our festivals attractive. One is the activities. The activities at, are at the core of what we do. And from the beginning, from 2007, this has been what attracts people the most to our festivals. They like our activities. Uh, and yes, our activities have evolved through, you know, throughout what, 14 years now, and they're always getting better, but they've always been good. And we're very careful with the type of activities that, uh, that we select, with how we develop them and so on. So one is the activities, two is our pedagogical approach. Our pedagogical approach makes people feel welcome. They, uh, they feel invited, they feel safe and it, it, it's fun. So, and that's also number three, part of the relaxed and festive atmosphere that we strive to foster. We wanna make sure that when you walk into a festival, 
you feel welcome that you know this is a space for you that it doesn't matter who you are where you come from uh what your socioeconomic status is it doesn't really matter this is a place for you to enjoy mathematics with like-minded individuals and uh, where they are for you so i will speak a little bit more about our pedagogical approach as, uh, as we progress and uh i think i might do that uh in action but more more about that later so now COVID hit and we had to go into lockdown uh, so our festivals uh, I want to start sharing again and then our festivals began one after another uh, canceling right so host said okay the host started contacting us look I cannot host my uh, my event uh, we even at, uh, in late March we wrote mid to late March, we wrote to all of our hosts, uh, kind of understanding what was happening. I mean, nobody really understood what was going on, right? I mean, we're talking about March, it's like, what's going on? And how long is this going to be with us? So we said, look, it might be better, it might be safer to just cancel your event, uh, just to be on the safe side. And we encouraged our, we did not tell our hosts to do that, we, but we did encourage them to uh, to cancel them uh, and to check with their local authorities. Turned out that everybody canceled their festivals and it was okay. But uh, then I remember, you know, Nancy and Mark, you know, came uh, to me and said, Hector, you know, what are we going to do? Um, and uh, I suggested that we have uh, webinars now, of course, now everybody does webinars. This wasn't innovative uh, uh, it's not innovative now uh, and I, I don't think it was innovative then but what I what I made it innovative what made it different was that we made sure that we made interactive webinars so we wanted to create an experience that mimicked being at an in-person festival so we wanted to have a, a a place a virtual space where people could join us and just have fun, explore mathematics, explore ideas, and build a sense of community. Now, this, I, I will, I have to say, building communities the way we did was not an explicit goal, but it was something that, I mean, we, we wanted it, but it, it really wasn't the goal, but it just happened more and more people began to be attracted to what we were doing. Excellent people, an incredible uh, incredible, really incredible talent began to come to us. And some of them are here, uh, like, like Neil Calkin and Gord Hamilton, who's just joining us. Uh, so an incredible amount of talent just began to be drawn to us. And they began offering their assistance you know, as, on a volunteer basis. And at, at one point, I think we had about 40 volunteers in one form or shape and they were all making great contributions whether it was to the uh, to to how we deliver our materials to how we create our materials to the the conversations that happened to the social spaces that were being created as we engaged with the communities and we were we were very excited uh, about this now when we decided to create our activities, uh, well, we knew we had to revise our activities. And this had been, this wasn't new to COVID. I mean, we knew we, it was uh, on our midterm goal to revise our activities. We knew we, we, knew we needed to do this. And it, COVID was just the perfect opportunity to devote more time and resources to revise our activities. And along with that, we had a problem. We didn't have uh, the manipulatives that we usually have at our festivals, the games, so that, that you know people touch, we want people to touch things. We want people to play with things, break them apart, to put them together. But we couldn't do that virtually. 
Uh, I mean, we could suggest, hey, we, we have this, this puzzle, we have this game. If you have a set of coins at home, if you have a set of chips at home, you can do this, you can do that. Yes, 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 we could do that. But many times people, they were, I, I remember uh, in one particular country, I don't remember which country, they said, we don't have any, we don't have coins. You know, we, we're, coins have been uh, taken out of circulation. So basically there are no coins. Uh, so, so I was like, oh, so these people have no coins. So if we have coin puzzles, they can't do them because they don't, they don't even have coins available. Um, so what we did was, okay, so let's create apps that mimic that experience, that mimic what participants would do at an in-person festival. And this took a lot of effort, a lot of feedback from people. This works, this doesn't work. And even take, for instance, a, a classic puzzle like the Tower of Hanoi. If you look at the Tower of Hanoi, and I'll, and I'll show you that now, if you look at the Tower of Hanoi, if you Google the Tower of Hanoi, you'll find tons of, of, of information and even apps about the Tower of Hanoi, right? But what you won't find, oh, what, I'm trying to click on this, okay. But what you won't find, so these are our slides, very colorful, very nice. But what you won't find about the Tower of Hanoi is, and you'll find, I said, lots and lots of apps, but you will not find an app like this, okay? That, Gifts, it's opening, come on, come on, be good. There we go. So notice that we have five blue buttons and each of those is a, I mean, you have the basic Tower of Hanoi problem that everybody, well, that many people know. And then you have four variations and you won't find apps for these variations anywhere else. For instance, uh, this is the basic Tower of Hanoi and you can, uh, and you can change the number of discs and you can change and then you can play and so on and move these discs, discs and so on. I'm not explaining the, the, the game. I'm just trying to show you something. But then if you go to say um, colored picks, um, so this is a variation, a very nice variation that, and you won't find, and this is the two color, I really like this one. So in here, you're trying to put all the yellow discs on the yellow peg and all the blue discs on the blue peg, and you're trying to do it in the minimal num uh, number of moves possible. So again, yes, if you go online, you will find this problem as an extension, uh, but you will not find an app to go along with it. Uh, so again, when we talk about the Julia Robinson Mathematics Festival, we are talking about our activities. Our activities are at the core of what we do. Without great activities, we simply do not exist. Now, um, let me show you, let me show you five types of activities. Um, classic puzzles, I just did. The Tower of Hanoi is a classic puzzle, but we also have uh, if you click on here, all activities, you'll see a longer list. So we also have, i um, looking for one at the bottom. Uh, we also have new puzzles created by uh, our staff. This one in particular was created by Gord Hamilton, who's joining us today. And so we have classic puzzles and we have new puzzles. And uh, these puzzles also have their own worries. Where, their own, there we go, their own apps. So you can play classic puzzles. You can play brand new puzzles that you'll find nowhere else. You can uh, look at old problems in a new dress, new problems in a, in a new dress. Let me, let me look for those. Uh, for instance, uh, let me just go back here. New pro old problems old problems in a new dress, like uh, it's not here yet. Oh, it's in the longer list. It's in the longer list. It will be here soon. Like trail mix. Trail mix is a, is an old problem. 
in a new dress, but I won't tell you what old problem that is, but it is an old problem in a new dress. And we also have problems that lead to open problems like ladybugs. Let me just go back. We did this one uh, last week. Oh, I didn't mention that when COVID, uh, COVID hit, we started doing webinars weekly. And we were doing three uh, webinars at three times uh, a day on Thursdays at first, 7 a.m. Eastern to cover our, to serve our Asian audience, 12 noon uh, Eastern to cover uh, Latin America and Spain. And in, that was in Spanish. And then 7 p.m. Eastern to cover uh, the US. And uh, we're now doing it on Saturdays, Saturdays at, uh, well, 11 a.m. Uh, 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern on Saturdays, that's the one in Spanish, and 7 p.m. Eastern, the one in English. And um, so going back to our activities, ladybugs, this, this activity is an activity that will lead into open problems. So it's a very, one of the things uh, that we strive for also is we have a low threshold, high ceiling. Uh, we, we, we want young children, six-year-olds even, we want them to be able to look at our activities, to be able to play with our activities. And if you happen to be a high school student, a college student, a college professor, it's okay too. You can also, there, there's, see, um, there was one time that we had a little situation at one of the main festivals and one of the main events. Um, this was, this was um, Math Fest in Cincinnati. And there was a misunderstanding with, uh, with the organizers and so on. So they said, um, they said, you know what? Uh, we had, we were hosting a festival and then they said, um, well, the children are free to come. They're free to join us, but their chaperones need to pay the one, the one day fee. And we said, wait a minute, the one, it's $80, $80. What parent is going to pay $80 for a free festival, uh, uh, it, it doesn't. It, this is. It, it doesn't make it free anymore. Uh, and there was there wasn't much we could do at the time, so we had to adjust. So we ended up doing the festival for whoever was there, and these were adults, you know, graduate students, uh, professors. So we ended up with about, I would say, between a hundred and hundred fifty uh, adults who were delighted with our activities uh, for about two hours. So even though we were confident about the quality of our materials, th that felt very reassuring and very, very good to see that an adult population could be just as engaged as a very young population. And this is not by accident, this is deliberate. Uh, the way we we make our activities, you know, we, we want that. We want a very low threshold and a very high ceiling so that everybody can gain from the experience of exploring mathematics at a Julia Robinson Mathematics Festival. Um, what else do I have here? So now, oh yes, and also we have some applications. So that's the, only, the other thing. So we also have uh, the, the fifth type of uh, uh, problems or activities. There are some applications. Um, you can see here, this one, pool testing uh, and, uh, and gerrymandering. So both gerrymandering and pool testing are, they, they, they have a feel for what, you know, they give you a feel for what applications or problems related to applications look like at a Julia Robinson Mathematics Festival. So are there any questions or comments before I go on? Hey, Hector, this is uh, Tony. Thanks for the overview. And then in a moment, for those that are attending, we're just going to enter into the rich Q&A part of this that will just have a dialogue with Hector and others that want to share their experiences. Hector, can you provide a little bit more description about what a typical math festival looks like, not the online? <clears throat> Who requests it? What does it look like? What types of space does it look like? 
give us like a, a virtual tour, if you would, yeah. of what a if somebody approached you and says, "What do you guys do? What does it look like?" Great, great question. Yes, um, people would uh, reach out to us and say, "Look." How do I do this? I want to do a festival and, I would, and we would give them support. We have the activities and uh, well, let's go back. What does it look like first of all? So we imagine a room full of children and uh, it, it's, it's kind of controlled chaos. So we have, you should, we prefer say an open space like a gym uh, and maybe 10, 15, 20, even up to 30 uh, tables or stations. And these are places where each station has an activity. And kids have the, the, the freedom to walk around. So say this is a two hour or three hour festival. So we start say at 11 a.m. and kids walk in with their, par their parents and they see something flashy, something colorful, like maybe Sydney Weaver's uh, uh, cubes. And uh, Sydney has been to to quite a few of our festival and Sydney is always uh, a hit and uh, and I'm glad that that she's here. She's always 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 a hit. You will see Sydney's table and uh, with some of her Rubik's cubes. She's a speed cuber among other uh, among other things and uh, and you will always see you know she's surrounded by it looks like a mob of kids that that you know maybe 10, 20 kids. Uh, and, uh, but it, it's all wonderful and fun. So kids who just walk around, this table looks good. This table maybe doesn't look as attractive to this child. So they go, eh, I don't like it. I'll go to another one. So, and we don't tell them go to this table, go to that table. We just let them choose. It could be that they spend one minute at a table, but we've seen kids spend two and three hours at just one table and their parents come to us and say, my kid has been there for two hours. How, how do I tell him or her to, to, to go? I said, don't, don't do, just, just let, let her be. You know, she likes what she's doing. She's enjoying herself at that table. That's perfect. That, that's just what we want. If they want to spend three hours at a table, let them be for three hours at a table. Oh, but they won't get to see anything else. But they will leave with a great impression of the festival. You know, they'll, yeah, they'll, they'll go home and say, oh, you know, I met this wonderful person and we did this. And yeah, they'll only know about one activity, but it's going to be a wonderful experience. And this is, this is what we want. We want people to go home and continue to think about our problems and continue to want uh, to do this. So you have, you know, 10, 15, 20, we do this at schools. So schools would reach out to us and sometimes we would go, we would send someone, um, and, uh, or sometimes we would do it remotely. We would tell them what to do, uh, what materials to, to, to buy. And so it's usually low cost, except for the, uh, like at the UNC Chapel Hill, when, when, uh, when I started doing festivals there, um, it was, I think it was about $1,200 to rent the main hall. And there was no way around it. You know, the, the university said, you have to pay for this. So if you can find a, a, a place for free, then that's even better. But sometimes you can't. So, you have, you know, that's those, those are costs that you have to uh, assume. So, Tony? So, Hector, when I went to the National Math Festival and met you and uh, Mark for the first time, you had colorful mats on the floor. Yes. And you had different stations with different types of games. Mm -hmm. So maybe in just a moment, we'll just open it up and invite Mark uh, and Sydney. You were, you were called out as well, if you want to give an example or what it looks like to participate. But uh, before turning it over to the Q&A, so Hector, you've mentioned some stations. Could you tell us how do you select the games of your feature? What, and just give us a few examples of what those stations look like for those that haven't been to a math festival before festival before and then I imagine some of the questions may be how do I partner with the Julie Robinson math festival but let's save that for like the Q&A but maybe a little bit more description about what the stations have themselves um, and like how do you select the games yeah well actually um, the games it's that's one of the things I was trying to get at you know as you see you see our activities you know we, we're very careful uh, with the, the problems, the activities that we select, we put a lot of effort into uh, uh, app development. And in fact, I see that uh, 
our uh, Daniel Klein has joined us. He has been behind uh, the app development uh, part and, uh, and that has been an, a, an amazing component. But th what he's trying to do is to replicate what we do at an in-person festival. When you go to our website, there's a, uh, maybe, there's a, there's a very short video here that will give a taste for that, I think it's in the here in the about us. So this is a very uh, this is old. Uh, it's it, I'm not gonna play all five minutes, but it's just to get a. Uh, I'm sorry. Was I sharing all, uh, uh, audio? No, but no, but that's no, fine. I wasn't sharing audio. Yeah, but I think folks got the idea. And they Things get it. folks got the idea. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to turn it off. Yeah, yeah no it's worries. okay. So, uh, Hector, would you mind? Let's just open it up if yeah. you don't mind at this point. Again, in the spirit of uh, folks that are drinking their favorite libations at home in our uh, e cafe experience. <laughs> So um, maybe folks who have participated, Sydney, what's it look like from your end in regards to participating in, uh, in one of the math festivals? And Mark, welcome to have your contribution, but then folks drop your questions in the chat or just jump in if you have a question for, uh, for Hector. Sydney, so uh, give us your perspective as a, as a presenter. Hi, so um, I've been working with Julia Robinson on and off since 2018, I believe. And since I've been participating in the festivals, as Hector said, I run a table regarding Rubik's Cubes. Now I say my table is a little bit different than most because I try to keep it very open-ended. And whatever a kid wants to do, whether they want to learn how to solve it, ask about commutators and conjugates, typically, you know, in those higher grades, or just watch and get interested in it, all of those are fine. And I just try to provide the best experience for them with a large variety of puzzles and to answer any of their questions. Um, I've helped to facilitate a few other random activities here and there, but it's mostly been the cube stuff and it gets a lot of attention because it's colorful, it's interactive. And as Hector said, the kids just sprint to the table when they see all the cubes on there. <laughs> Great, thanks Sydney. All right, maybe just, uh... I know the other folks have participated. Let's just jump on in. Folks want to share their experiences with the festival or questions for Hector? Yeah, I, and I should say about Sydney that kids are usually impressed because I mean, they see Sydney and they think, okay, so here's someone who knows how to solve uh, the Rubik's cube, but they don't know <laughs> that she uh -huh. is world-class level. They, they, they don't know that, the, the, you know, uh, that she holds, you know, records that, you know, that what her time, her best time is to solve a three by three that she can solve three by three with, with her feet blindfolded. You know, it, it's not just solving a three by three by three Rubik's cube. It's all, all of the other things that she does. Uh, I mean, learning a Rubik's cube uh, and solving it uh, blindfolded, it's one thing. And it's another thing to solve it one year after you've memorized uh, that that particular right Sydney so 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 this is, there are stages so she can solve a puzzle uh, she can uh, solve it blindfolded and she can uh, solve it blindfolded one year after she memorized a particular arrangement of a cube so there, there are stages and when they see those things it's like oh wait a minute uh, this person is not just some random guy some random girl solving a puzzle there, there's a lot more behind it Great. All right. So folks, what attract those that have joined us as well, given your interest or background, what specific questions did you have for Hector and colleagues about um, Julie Robinson or organizing math festivals? Just feel free to jump in with your questions. Hi, Anthony and uh, Hector. Thank you so much for the great presentation. And um, Tony, I mean, I think that's 
we miss so much the Am Education Alliance um, I would call it festival <laughs> because it it allowed us uh, it allowed some of the missions to really move forward with their innovative approaches to education in general and it made a huge difference in in those countries that I, where I have worked specifically in Morocco. Um, I have a question uh, for Hector. Under the present constraints of COVID, and sorry if you have already tackled this because I joined a little late, um, under the present circumstances and moving forward, do you think these festivals could be managed virtually um, to involve more youth, specifically uh, children and youth who are in remote areas and who, even if we could do the face-to-face, -face, would not be able to join because they are so far? Um, if in the best um, case scenarios where there is electricity and connections uh, and Wi-Fi, uh, would, do you think this type of festivals could be uh, provided virtually to, an, I mean, to the target youth? Overnight? Yeah, and Hector, if I could just jump in. Miriam, thank Please you. Do. So Miriam, who's with USAID. And it, Hector, I was almost gonna say, let's see if there's, if it's okay, one or two other questions and then see if we have additional rounds for a few other questions just okay. to make sure. Miriam, yep. I'm going to write them down then. Go ahead. Yeah, virtual. Okay, um, just take one or two others so that we could just, I want to have a few rounds of Q&A so we could stretch out Hector sharing his experience. Uh, anybody else want to sort of add to the, the general questions for Hector? All right, I'm going to put one out, Hector, for either you or go ahead, Mark. Um, Sid is a superstar, and I love watching her. Do you need somebody like that for to make a, fe a, a, a festival successful? I mean, there's only one Sydney. Let's face it. Okay, so perfect, Hector. The thank you, Mark. And then Hector, a third question that I'll ask you is uh, again, maybe Mark. If you could give us an idea of like the last festival you did internationally, maybe in light of a low resource setting. Uh, I know that there was a festival in Ghana, Hector, you might wanna sort of mention that. Who's the local organization that you worked with? That might be uh, of interest as well as folks. All right, so Hector, you've got three questions. There you go. Yes, um, so first about virtual festivals and what we've done. So I, I did address that a little bit, but but I, I can talk more about it. Um, so. What we have done is to create webinars and we have, and I didn't mention it before, we have uh, right now even webinars on request. So not only do, do we have webinars that we give on Saturdays, but we also have webinars on request. But this is just a one activity. So we do just like we do one activity on Saturdays and we open them to the public. We also have webinars on request where teachers, and uh, other math enthusiasts will reach out to us and say, I wanna do one festival uh, and let me show you, let me show you what that might, and so they reach out to us and say, oh, I wanna do something. I wanna do a festival, what can we do? And I'm looking for that right now under events, webinars on request. And uh, so uh, right now this started mm, not even three weeks ago. And we've done quite a few already. Um, so these are uh, these are the ones that we're planning or doing and so on. Um, so you see the flags of the countries, and uh, so these are these are new. And I'm I'm very excited with this one for new, with the New Brunswick Public Schools because I'm working with the with the math. Uh, the supervisor of mathematics for the district. And I, I started giving workshops to the, to, the, um, to the math coaches, so the math specialists. So I did that and I'm gonna do four or five in a row. And then I'm gonna start working. They want me to start working directly with teachers also. So this is, a, a, this is new. I mean, we, we, we are working directly with the school district and uh, that wants to, implement their approach to mathematics is similar i, I was surprised uh, so I, I i know we're very excited about uh, about this uh, so now 
to, to address the question about a math festival online, we have tried that. And we, we've done, I, I would say about five or six, they don't work as well. Uh, basically it is, okay, so let's do a webinar with uh, five instead of one activity and a hundred people, a hundred people, and then just five different activities and you get to choose an activity. But see one of the element of choice is extremely important in our festivals. We want children to have the freedom to walk around and choose that element of freedom. Even though there are some platforms that, that allow for that experience where you can leave this room and go into another room. I've seen several platforms and I'm not, I'm not convinced with, with the delivery. I'm not convinced with the product. I, I'd rather have to give them a choice. I say, look, we're going to have these five problems, these five activities, which one would you like to do? And you're, and you can pick two or three, which one would you like to do first, second, and third. And then we, we rotate either facilitators from room to room, or then we take a five minute break and you say, you go from this room, you go into that other activity, say for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 60 minutes. We found that this works best, but again, this is up to the host. If the host has something different in mind, we're more than willing to oblige and see what needs to be done. Um, and then there was there were two more questions. Um, uh, yes. Mark asked whether we need a superstar like Sydney. Um, this is a great uh, point. No, it's not that we need a superstar, but we do. I often tell hosts that the, the difference between a great festival and a not so good festival is your facilitators. If you have good facilitators, well-trained facilitators, you're bound to have a great experience. If your facilitators are not so good, that's gonna be troublesome. Um, and uh, so we wanna make sure that uh, your, your volunteers, your table leaders have enough time to prepare. Usually they only need to worry about one activity. So it's not like they need to know all 10, 20 activities. No, 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 it's just one activity. And they, you know, if most of them will, well, mo many people will feel more comfortable with whether they know the problem well and, you know, all the, the intricacies of the problem. A, a, a well-versed and an experienced facilitator really doesn't need that. Many of our most experienced facilitators will walk into a, a station without knowing the problem and they'll know exactly what to do. But this takes a lot of, it takes experience uh, to do it like that, but we can train people and we do train people. You, you know, like People can join our Monday uh, training sessions in English or our Tuesday training sessions in Spanish where we just train for the particular activity that we will be seeing that week. Um, so this is a way to gain experience as a facilitator. Now about Ghana. Uh, yes, we had a wonderful experience in, in Ghana. Uh, and uh, this particular contact, Osman, uh, our contact in, 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 at the Gambaga College of Education in Ghana, he, I think he was wonderful. Uh, he is, he's outgoing. He, this is exactly one thing that I learned from Tatiana Shubing. Uh, from the Navajo math circles and uh, uh, the San Jose math circle. One thing that I learned from Tatiana is that it, when you do outreach, you, you, need to, you need to get in touch with local leaders and you need to let them be the champions. You know, you, you, you have ideas, yes, but you need to, you're there to, you want to make contact and you want to let them lead. This is not about you leading. This is not about... Uh, it's about if you really want to make an impact, then you just, you have to, it's like, like Tatiana said, says from, from, uh, from, you know, connections uh, uh, to, to invitations, you need to be invited. You need to be invited to, to, to be a part of the community. You, you don't just invite yourself. It, it doesn't work that way. Um, so sometimes it takes time to build these relationships and it's okay. Um, so actually now we are working with, with Tony and the um, Alliance with a great project uh, in the African uh, continent. So maybe Tony will want to speak more about that uh, later. Uh, more questions. 
Uh, yes, Mark says, yes. The initial contact remains, cent yes. The, the, the initial contact, it, it is true. It remains central, that's the central contact, yes. Um, so, so building international relations is very, it, it takes time and it, then you also need to understand the, the cultural nuances. Uh, something that something that you do that you find say something like saying thank you uh, it is expected in, in America to say thank you to pretty much anything you do uh, you know people do a little bit and you say thank you and we, we see it as an expression of gratitude but in India this can be taken as offensive you don't say thank you in India it's uh, uh, you, you just don't and there is a word uh, uh, for thank you, dhanyavad. But if, when you look at ancient Indian history, this word is it's really not there because uh, uh, gratitude is expressed in different ways. And uh, there, there are stories about people uh, uh, in you know people of Indian ancestry who go to India and begin to say thank you to their relatives in India, and they they feel offended. It's like wait, you don't say thank you, you mm -hmm. know, uh, you know. I'm doing so, 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 so you need to be careful with about these things. Um, if you go into a Muslim country, so what norms should you observe? Uh, what is so again, you have to be cognizant of these things. And if you do make a mistake and you will make mistakes, uh, then you need to learn how to navigate the situation so that it is seen as a genuine mistake, not as something that you did intentionally uh, and so on. Thanks, Hector. So that's great. Maybe just one more round of, uh, so Hector, just in terms of picking up that last point about cultural sensitivities that may even manifest itself in terms of what activities I imagine are highlighted yes. at yes. various yeah. math festivals. And Mark, to your question about uh, champions as well, uh, I imagine that you wanna highlight the work of existing math institutions in a country, that it's an opportunity to put a spotlight and probably broaden the opportunity that they have provide technical assistance or training mm -hmm. to teachers or at our recent Play Every Day event, for those, uh, maybe Nicole, you could drop in the link. We had a hundred presentations from 23 countries on the theme of Play Every Day. Many of those were math focused. So for example, um, Gord, who's uh, participating in this session as well, was able to present folks from Think Fun Games, uh, other Scott Kim, who are math recognized math champions. But also what was really exciting is we had math game developers from India and Uganda, basically talking about math products that they had produced. So a great way for that cross-cultural exchange. Um, other sort of uh, specific questions for Hector, or just if there's folks that are on that just wanna share their own sort of related experience in regards to math games, we have a, around maybe another round of questions, but invite people to be able to ask those now. And Daniel, I see that you've been busy sort of dropping stuff in. Do you just want to introduce yourself, Daniel, and the work that you sure. do for? Um, hi, I'm Daniel. Um, I'm the executive director of GRMF. Um, I've been in education for a while now. I got my bachelor's in mathematics from the University of Chicago, spent a year in an education nonprofit called City Year, got my master's uh, in mathematics education from the University of Pennsylvania, taught high school for a bit. Um, spent a semester abroad in Budapest studying uh, how to teach mathematical concepts through games and manipulatives, which uh, inspired the work that I get to do now. Um, a lot of the apps and activities I've gotten the privilege of getting to work on and create for a wonderful community. Um, and I've also gotten to work with a wonderful community and doing some really wonderful fun math. Um, I, everything that Hector said, uh, I, I, uh, I, I, I think is wonderful. Um, as you said, we have weekly webinars for kids. We also have weekly webinars for adults if you wanna get involved that way. Um, and we have lots of supports if you want to start running your own math festivals and your own math events, like our weekly facilitator trainings. I dropped a link in, in, in chat. Um, as well as Hector said, our uh, webinars earn request program 
So if you are interested in starting your own webinars or your own virtual festivals, um, we're completely open to working with you in whatever capacity you think is most helpful to get you started on using our materials and our resources in uh, the most effective way possible. Um, and um, as I just said, we've worked with people to do webinars just like we do that focuses on a single activity. And we've also helped people set up, uh, set up webinars that involve multiple activities to try to replicate that festival feel. Um, and so we're always looking for new people to partner with and new organizations to work with um, and new ways to bring our cool, fun math into kids' lives. Great. And uh, Daniel and Hector, I see, or both feel free, I think, to drop your email addresses in. Um, hey, Hector and Daniel, give us just a sense of the size of the Julia Robinson Math Festival. Uh, I know that you have a number of affiliated partners, but could you give us a little bit more sort of a description of what... Uh, of what it looks like as an institution. Daniel, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, so the organization itself has about um, 14 people working for us now. We have um, a handful of full-time people, but it's mostly part-time people. And really, our, the only reason why we're able to do what we're able to do is because of volunteers and our really wonderful community. Um, we're definitely a community-based organization. and. Um, anything that we can do to broaden that community or provide more supports for our community, uh, we're always looking for, for new avenues to do that. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the reach of the, act, the, the events that we run, um, before COVID hit, we were planning to do uh, over 120 festival, in-person festivals across the country and across the world. Um, now with our uh, online virtual webinars, we're reaching about um, 100 to 100 to 300, depending on the week, uh, 100 to 300 students and educators uh, with, with, with our weekly webinars. Um, but really, I think our webinars on request have been probably one of the most successful things that we're currently doing. Um, we are reaching, you know, dozens to hundreds of people at each one of these webinars and requests. And as Hector showed on our webinars and request page, um, we're getting more and more requests as time goes on. This is a very new initiative that we started about a month ago. Um, and already we've done webinars and requests in um, four different continents uh, all across the world. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question or yeah, if there are other. Thank okay. you, Daniel. Well, maybe it just as we're wrapping up for the, um, just for the hour, um, so first of all, I just want to say thank you to uh, Hector, Daniel, Mark, with your long engagement, and I see other sort of global math champions, Gord's on the line as well. Uh, just in terms of the work that you're doing as a community to make math fun and to reach a broad uh, audience. Uh, so that's why we're really so excited that among other activities, uh, Julie Robinson Math Festival, uh, along with a variety of other partners, are involved with the M Education Alliance for us to help extend uh, this experience uh, virtually and, and not virtually, uh, you know, tech and non-tech, to the countries where the M Education Alliance partners work. So, for example, we've been in discussions, as Hector had mentioned, uh, with organizing virtual math festivals in a variety of regions, including starting with Africa in the first quarter of next year. Um, we also have a variety of other activities we're doing under a broad banner called Math Power. And Nicole, if you want to drop in the link to one of our activities, which is an app competition that basically we're gonna be launching in the next uh, few weeks that basically is focused on uh, an app that the back end, while it may be sophisticated, the front end is, will be disseminating math game descriptions to low income households. That's the ambition, which is get description of some of the Julia Robinson math games, other sort of math games that you could basically use um, household manipulables or stuff that you have at hand basically to do math games uh, in a household as just one activity, for example, in re response to COVID. So if you'd like more information about our math power initiatives, how you can get involved, please let us know. Um, I also just wanna say uh, in general, uh, again, just to applaud the work of the Julia Robinson Math Festival. Um, there may be activities in your country and the connections that you have uh, Hector and Daniel to a variety of organizations around the world that are math champions. Your engagement, for example, in the, the National Math Festival, and that's gonna be, this year's event will be virtual, running, I guess, from December to April. Is that right, uh, Hector and Daniel, the National Math Festival? Yeah, yeah yes. 
Yes, and, and we are, I, I should say, we are the inspiration behind the National Math Festival. Uh, I mean, the, the Jilla Ramos and Mathematics Festival is the inspiration uh, behind Math Festival and behind other things around the world. I mean, uh, so uh, the Jilla Ramos and Mathematics Festival started as a program of the of, of MSRI, of the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute. Then we moved on to, to AIM, the, the American Mathematics, uh, the American Institute of Mathematics. And now our fiscal sponsor is C, the Social and Environmental Entrepreneurs. So, uh, but yeah, I, I, I just wanted to, to, to mention that. Um, Perfect. Well, maybe let's do our virtual, either a thumbs up or a round of applause for Hector's contributions uh, to today's uh, eCafe. Uh, Hector, that was terrific just to be able to give sort of a um, background to the work and hopefully planting seeds for some collaboration for the folks that are part of this event. We've recorded this event. We'll be making it available as well, along with our YouTube series of other presentations from eCafes and events like Play Every Day. As I mentioned, should you have additional questions about the M Education Alliance, please visit our webpage or drop uh, Nicole or I or Scott an email. And uh, Nicole, do we have... Do we want to give a, a preview of what the next eCafe is, uh, even, even though we, I don't know if we have a specific date for it, but before we conclude? Yes, of course. So we're actually going to be doing an eCafe with GSMA um, relatively soon. They just came out a with a report on education technology during COVID. Um, so look forward um, to some emails being dropped in your inbox for when the date of when that will be happening. Great. And the GSMA is a member of the Alliance. They represent most of the mobile service providers around the world. Um, and they, uh, as Nicole had mentioned, they'll be talking about a recent report they did on uh, ed tech with mobile te technologies. All right, well, that's a wrap on uh, Thursday for this, uh, this instance of eCafe. As I mentioned at the beginning, one of you will be a lucky recipient of our, uh, our, um, our uh, eCafe uh, t-shirt um, brought to you by Cafe Justo, a project they were collaborating with uh, in Agua Prieta, Mexico. Uh, if you have any additional questions or comments about this eCafe, recommendations for future presenters, let us know. But other than that, I want to thank uh, Nicole for helping organize this uh, yet again, and for all of you for joining us today. So thanks so much. Thank you for the invitation, and uh, I look forward to our continued collaboration.